of Quality Estate Distributors. One of my favourite named wine businesses in Australia. Really? By the way, Quality Estate Distributors. There's no bad wine here. Uh, no, no. I, I didn't come up with the name either, so I can't even <laughs> take claim to it. How are you, mate? Or should I say, in light of uh, today's conversation, Como Vai? Is that no, pronounced correctly? To the wine. To the wine. Yeah. Me too, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> good. Good, good, good. Matt, um, why Portugal? What, what, what took you to Portugal to bring these wines into Australia and, and fall in love with, with this winemaking country? Uh, well, in my early 20s, I was fortunate to live in Portugal uh, for about 18 months. And I just really love, love the people. Oh, well, probably even goes back cl- further than that. When I was in my uh, apprenticeship doing uh, cooking, I, um, I worked with probably three or four Portuguese guys and they used to invite me to their house and, and cook for me and they'd make these amazing squid dishes with squid ink and um, they, all, they all had, had their homemade wines. They weren't very good, but they were <laughs> homemade wines. Um, and just very hospitable and, and just good people. So meeting them in my youth kind of got me to thinking that when I'm in Europe, I'm definitely going to Portugal. Mm. And then when I was in, living in London, um, a friend of ours had just come back from this little island off the coast of Portugal and said, this place was ama- amazing, you've really got to go there. And it was a little island off the coast of Faro and it was like a big lagoon with lots of different spotted islands. No electricity, no running water, you had your own well, you had to go on, on a ferry across to Faro every day to get your produce and then come back. And we kind of just chilled there for two weeks and that was awesome. How good. Yeah. And were you getting in, you probably weren't getting to the fine wine so much. No, no. Well, that kind of came after we, we went to, um, we went and lived in Morocco for about seven months. And then the plan was always to kind of Portugal, Spain, Morocco, then come back. And so then when we came back into um, uh, Faro, we we made our way up to Lagos, which is kind of a, Mm. the Algarve, it's a touristy area, I suppose, looking for work. And I (laughs) worked in a caravan park um, until I could get a job because I needed money and um, flipping burgers. Uh, And then I heard about this um, Kiwi guy, Darcy Glover, who used to have a restaurant here in in Sydney, two restaurants actually called um, Darcy's, one in Paddington, one in Double Bay. Um, And he knew where I'd trained in Sydney and gave me the head chef's job straight away. And then I worked worked with him for uh, probably 14 months or Mm. thereabouts. And so I ran his kitchen. Uh, My girlfriend at the time ran the bar and we had a Portuguese maitre d'. And so we had this great team and, and we'd always look at wines after work. Yeah. And that was kind of the introduction to, to good Portuguese wines. Yeah, right. And a lot's probably changed within Portuguese wine in the hundred years since then. <laughs> Just <laughs> Well, let's look at the only a few No, like no, 40. but it's, no, it's, it's, it's such an exciting winemaking country, I think, you know. Yeah, known, it's untapped. Known for, you know, really, obviously port, um, yeah. you know, famously, but evolving so much. Yeah, it's really the last, uh, since 2000. Really, when the evolution started to kind of come, and uh, you know, socialism was probably on the downturn a little bit of. Well, it was almost communist, I guess, in, in dare I say it. But um, a lot of Portuguese uh, families that had escaped to France were kind of had gr- grown up in France or, or moved there as couples and had kids. Um, had these francophile children that coming back to their farms in in Portugal and. And, and just uh, sort of tapping into their history of, you know, I think there's about 380 mapped uh, Indigenous varieties at the moment, and there's still more being mapped. Uh, the Romans were there, so there's a lot of um, uh, amphora use as well, which we're probably starting to see more and more as a, as a vessel to, to ferment and, and store wine. Um, and then kind of next generation... Um, family members taking over from their dad as well. Like, you know, Louis Pado having Philippa Pado kind of do her own thing, but also having him in the background. So he's kind of like a bit of a rock, rock star there, but um, it's old world, you know, and yeah. they've got old vines and they've yeah. got uh, old vine material in a very diverse geographical small part of Europe. That's yeah, it's from maritime through to alpine to, to different uh, soil pro Profiles like schist and and um, and granite and and limestone and clay and loam and lots of different uh, it's landscapes exciting. and 
So, so obviously you didn't stick around in Portugal. You came back to Australia. You know, got a fantastic distribution business here. And, and um, so uh, what, I guess, led you to bring in the Portuguese wines? And today we're looking at the wines of, of, of Luis Seabra. Yeah. Um, who I, I think is a, you know, real, like, modern star of, of Portuguese wine in, in this more contemporary style. And so I guess what, what introduced you to, to Louis wines and, and um, you know, talk to us a little bit about that. We're sipping, by the way, yeah. the white wine, which is incredible, the 2021 Zista Cru um, from, from the Duro, which is um, the, the single site um, sort of blend, Yeah, single, single vineyard, uh, old vine, um, Rabagato is the dominant uh, white grape varietal there. But um, I actually was... I went to a biodynamic tasting in Hong Kong and there were a couple of Portuguese producers there that um, kind of tweaked me to thinking that Portugal is an untapped uh, entity of, of Europe that no one's really doing a lot with. And yeah, you've got you know, big names like Kinder de Cresta that, that are, have been there for a long time making you know, terrific wines, but they're still very old, old school. Whereas, whereas Louis, um, he's a master viticulturalist, he's a master um, uh, winemaker, oenologist, and he, he spent 12 years working with, with Dirk Nearport right at the very beginning of them moving out of that fortified wine era to a table wine era uh, and trying to, to make um, you know, European wines of, of uh, acid bone structures and, mm. and not too high alcohols. and. Uh, and not trying to have over influence um, fruit with with new oak, I guess. So yeah, Louis very much at the the forefront. They, they call, call call him the the rock star of of the Douro, but really Portugal because he's yeah. he's been doing it for for twenty nearly twenty five years now. So he's kind of the face of of that modern winemaking. And even you look at the labels are, are, are quite modern. Yeah. Um, and so for him, it's it's. Having worked with Dirk Newport for 12 years, he kind of learned more about his craft and, and two great wine mines and, and just getting to know where all the great vineyards are in, that, in the Douro as well, yeah. but also open to, to you know, sourcing fruit from the Dow or from, from Minnow or, yeah. This is, this is amazing wine. Like this, this reminds me of, you know, like Top Chablis, like Premier Cru, Grand Cru Chablis or, or, or some top Loire Valley Chenin Blanc, like the, the acidity. Yeah, and that minerality that runs throughout the wine yeah. is incredible, and the length it gives it. And then he's he's a master at working in texture, texture uh, around yeah. that. I mean, yeah. Um, so this is a yeah, single vineyard, single um, single site. Uh, the wine goes. All the wines are obviously hand picked. Well, not obvious, but you know they are. Uh, they are naturally fermented, and all of his whites go through full malo. Which you kind of need when you look at the acid yeah. in that wine. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, he uses the same barrels pretty much every year, so more punchins than than barriques, but yep. um, yeah, just nurturing the site. So that it's more about a site rather than yeah, and like, the varieties. Like, yeah, the, than the, the varietals. The, 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 the mix of native varieties. Like I mean, some of the names he works with won't be yeah. able to get to Australian wine drinkers. Oh, I know. It's exciting, I know. Though. I mean, I think a lot of Portuguese varietals in Australia. Um, would work really well, and they in McLaren Vale is kind of the yeah. the, the melting pot for for experimenting and parts with of those. The Riverland and now planting, you know, things like Titicao and, and right. then these sort of varieties as well, which yeah. is which is exciting. Yeah. So the main varietal here is uh, is a wine uh, varietal called Rabagato. Yeah. Stunning. Oh, I love that wine, and and uh, just the the power and and um, drive it has. It's yeah. Amazing. Like he makes some some. Um, some similar versions of, of that of that sort of blend at a cheaper price point, but that's that's a remarkable one. I think. Yeah, that's kind of his. Yeah, it's definitely his benchmark white. Yeah. So you mentioned he's, he's also operating outside the Duro Valley, so um, in the Dow, uh, and that's I believe where this one comes from, is it? Yeah, the, that's the, right. So the, um, the next mono, one we're trying is the A. Mono A, A uh, for Alfa Cato. Um, and, and so the, mon the mono wines obviously being single varietal. Yeah, exactly. Things, yeah. Hence, yeah, mono varietal, mono A. Um, so the main reason he he's, he's sourcing fruit from from the Dow uh, for this and the other Granito Crew wine is that he um, consults to a, a winery there, and so he takes fruit in payment for for the work that he does with them. And, and what what are the I guess. Key differences between the Dow and the Duro, which are two the two probably you know most iconic kind yeah, of um, red regions. Altitude, I guess. Yeah. Um, and 
with the duro, it's all about schist yep. and different forms of schist. So blue, yellow, silver, micro. Um, and then because of the, the duro river being like a snake, so you've got, you know, that um, uh, the site comes into a microclimate. Yeah, yeah. And, all and, the different aspects. So. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, and then the, the height of the vineyards. And so some of the vineyards are probably the lowest to be about 400, I guess, and then they're up to 700 with, with duro, whereas uh, with the Africado, it's about 550 above the yeah. sea level and yeah, granite, granite based soils effectively. So uh, it is alpine country. It is, it is um, uh, the Dow is the highest uh, mountainous region in, in the whole of Portugal as well. Right. When I taste that to me, it looks like, uh, like Cru Beaujolais or even like, you know, maybe Valtellina, kind of Nebbiolo, like those more kind of elegant, lifted, lighter styles, but still with that lovely tannin kind of backbone to it. Yeah. Um, it, but just so light and fresh. Yeah. I mean, I think um, these, this is a lovely glass to taste these wines out of too. I think um, the vessel does make a big difference. I've looked at the, the wine today and, uh, yeah, and of course the different glasses. The Gabriels, yeah. Gabriel's great. Um, yeah, so it's, it's you know, this, he always is quite restrained with his alcohols and hmm. um, and he's a, he's a, he wouldn't call himself a chef, but he's a great cook and he's got a commercial kitchen. So it's always about the food and, hmm. and the wine matching with the food. So he's very mindful of, of producing a wine that's very food friendly. And I mean, I think this is, you know, perfect food wine, really. I think Portugal um, is, is quite at the forefront in terms of like sustainability and, and things as well, from, from my understanding. Like... Yeah, they're getting there. Yeah, I, I mean, when I lived there, all, all produce that you could source, fruit and veg wise, was all organic. Yeah. And it wasn't until they became part of the EU that things started to change because money talks. And so, and they were a relatively poor country. And so all these big European co companies and coming in and kind of changing the whole mindset, I guess. Yeah. But it's flipped again. And so now it's all getting back to the land, yeah. um, nurturing a lot of these old neglected uh, vineyards back to health again uh, and doing it um, organically, biodynamically. They've now, um, as I was saying before, the, the Demeter certification now uh, is is um, is in Portugal, so you know it's definitely a good thing. Yeah, you know, and and those and, that are really serious about it. Yeah, uh, and Louis certainly it. look. You know, use, using organic and biodynamic principles with the wine. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so yes, he's definitely all, all about um, no no pesticides, fungicides, herbicides at all. Um, he's not certified, but you know he could easily be certified organic. And he does use biodynamic preparations as well. So, yeah. and then in, with the winemaking, you touched on it before, but um, very little additions. Yeah, he's not no, adding yeast or acid or no, anything like that. All no, wild ferment. Um, yeah. you know, a touch of sulphur. I think his words were just to keep the wines on track or keep them stable. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, like a lot of the great, more natural kind of wine producers in in the world, really. Um, yeah. And and you see that in the wines, there's this beautiful purity, and you feel yeah. like you're tasting grapes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And then that, I mean that's. Obviously, attention to detail, but it's also coming back to um, vineyard management and, and you know hand picking and um, with all the reds, they are whole bunch pressed underfoot in big open lagares, either made from stainless steel or from from um, uh, from schist yeah. or granite, um, and then and a long time on on skins and on on um, stalks uh, just to kind of manage those tannins. And I mean, that's another great thing about his wines is the, the management of tannin. Mm. You know, they're, they're, they're there, obviously, and, and you see the whole bunch component in the wine, but they're, you know, as young wines, they're still quite integrated, but as they get aged, they really come into the wine. So. And I think when, you've, when the tannin's coming from the grapes, not from, from wood, that makes a big difference as mm. well, right? There's no, mm. you don't get those blocky tannins, those chunky tannins. They're yeah, fine exactly. And, and, and that expression, like as you're saying, of pure fruit, you know, yeah. it's, yeah. Oh, I love that one. That's yeah, that's as, looking... as a lover of those sort of lighter reds. Yeah, that's you know. I mean, I just Portuguese I, Pinot. <laughs> absolutely, I look at it and I think, God, I'd love to be drinking some char, eating some char grilled sardines with that. Yeah. Why didn't you bring something? You're oh, the no. chef, aren't oh, you? No, no, no. <laughs> you just don't get the port. You don't get sardines in Australia like you do in the out of the Atlantic because they're enough. they're big and fat and juicy. So the, the last ones. last red for us here, um, and which is the uh, the the 2020 Indie Zisto. 
Um, talk to us a little bit about that map, but also I guess you can't talk about Portuguese wine without talking about port, you know, and, and yeah. you're seeing within the Duro a real shift from, as global trends have changed, yeah. um, away from port, and I, I'm sure there's, there are some mini resurgences happening too in that space, but generally yeah, speaking, uh, away from port to, to table wines, um, but you've got these resources, these amazing old vineyards yeah. and great, you know, incredible native varieties that went to port. Yep. And you've got clever people now like, like Lewis who's, who are you know, able to blend these together and make these amazing wines. Yeah, so I think uh, one thing that um, Lewis tries to do is, is stay away from Tariga Nacional mainly because he feels that it dominates the wine too much. Yeah, big big personality, Tariga. Yeah. So Tintorores is his, kind of his favourite red to work with, which is... Tempranillo in Spanish. Um, and so they're kind of, it doesn't dominate the wine here, but it's about 20%, I yep. guess. And Ruffet's probably about another 20%. Um, Tintacao. Um, hey, Tintorores, is that? Tintorores, yeah. Uh, Malvasia, yeah. yeah. There's, there's about seven or eight varietals in, in this one. And, you know, I guess you could call it a field blend because. It is, it, is, a, it, is, it is a single it, site. It is a it? single site, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Are they all, talk to us about this vineyard, I don't know if you've visited these sites or not, but are, are the wines, all, the grapes all kind of co-planted within yes, this Yes, they vineyard? are. Yeah, they are. That's wild. Um, I did, I've tried to read up on the history of, of why they did it and how they did it, but there doesn't seem to be any real um, science to it. Mm-hmm. So, but there was a science to it because they would kind of work out if they picked a block as a single vineyard block, and then they would co-ferment all of those varietals together, then, you know, I guess over it the course works. of a century or two, yeah. you kind of work out, hey, we need more acid in that, or we need some more ripeness of so fruit plant, in that. Plant, so plant, plant, let's plant a bit a more of something this. else, or, yeah. yeah. And is that how close to that method is, is Louis using with this wine? Like, is he, is he picking these things together? And uh, are any co-ferments happening? Mm, or? He's a bit more scientific. A little bit more scientific, yeah. He, he tends to, um, yes, a lot of it is picked together and a lot of it's crushed underfoot together, but some of it is kept separate as well. And it's almost like foot stomped, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. yeah. Arm and arm. Yeah. Big, like, you know, massive areas of you know, 10 metres by 10 metres, some of them. Oh, I was reading, is he mucking around with some larger format kind of Eastern European vessels yes. as well? Yes, yeah. He's using a bit of uh, Slovenian oak, yep. uh, some Austrian oak as well. Uh, again, just that whole mindset of fruit first, yeah, oak to support. That is a stunning red wine. Oh, that's yeah. beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing. Like I think it's it's a wine that if you're a wine lover, you you see it for for the wine that it is, yeah. not the varietal, and then maybe the varietal flavour profile kind of comes second. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you, texture like is the thing that comes to mind with his wines, and like I don't know, it's a bit of a vague term, texture. But like, you do see there are wines that have an overt fruitiness about them, and, and, and mm. one flavour that dominates. Yeah, and in his wines, they really feel like a tapestry, and these these little accents and nuances, and, and yeah, it's all about structure, yeah. balance, texture. Beautiful food wines, obviously. Yes, uh, and also for those reasons, the wines can be very long lived and, and age beautifully as well. When you've showed us wines with some age, they, they look amazing. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think in the past, one of the um, probably the, the downsides of the old school wine thinking of winemaking, you know, it would take you probably like old Barolos back in you know 30, 40 years ago. It took 20 years for them to, to come good for you to be able to drink them. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the, that's kind of like Portugal, the old school stuff. It's like yeah. they're bringing out wines that are 15, 60 years old, they're still fresh as a daisy, but. You know, these are so elegant. But these are, you know, unapproachable on, on release. Yeah. And again, it's about that whole, you know, whole bunch component, um, tannin, um, manipulation of tannins and, and yeah. working the tannins. Well, Lewis's wines are, are amazing, and, and I think, you know, our kind of go to, I guess, for the modern Portugal. But you've got some other great producers that you're bringing to Australia as well. Yeah, any other exciting. producers we should try? Any other regions or styles to, to look out for that are exciting? Yeah, well, I think Philip Pado and, and William Wooters, um, Pado and Wooters out of the Barada region are, uh, you know, and they're good, they're good friends actually with Lewis. Where's the Barada? Um, so region? they're in Barada, is, um, so if you're, I'm going to do it this way. Yeah. So um, Vino Verde or Mino is up here, yep. and then the Duro kind of sits underneath it. Yep. Then you kind of got the Dow, and then to the left of the Dow, you've got right, Barada. Right, so closer to the... Um, it's the quite Atlantic. a big region. It's coastal yeah. as well. 
but it, it does have kind of elevation of mountains or undulating hills up mm. to about 350 metres. But the main difference with Barada is, is limestone. Right. And so with the, the varietals like Bicarl and Arinto, mm. that's lap up that limestone and you, you really see it in the wines. That's exciting. Yeah, really exciting. So and you do, do, you, do you do anything from further south? An uh, or anything like uh, that? Lisbon or Lisboa. Yep. Um, we've got Casal Figuera doing uh, one of the first biodynamic farms or vineyards in, in Portugal. Doing, again, mono varietals. Um, um, Vital, which is a, a white that was almost extinct until Casal Figuera brought it back. Um, Tintamoida, um, Castelau. So, yeah. yeah, interesting varietals. Uh, I think, I think the Dow is kind of like a bit of a bit of a rock star region though, because of its elevation and because yep. of the granite. Yeah. And again, that old vine material. Um, yeah, yeah, it's exciting. I think as well for for Australian palates, there's a lot that's very recognisable mm. in Portugal. Mm. You know, it's a warmer climate, but also quite. Coastal in, in parts as well. Yeah. Um, and <coughs> and see, you've got a surfing culture. And the surfing culture, most importantly. And, yeah. you know, the, the uh, charming accents. and Yeah. <laughs> um, but, no, I think you see styles in the wines that, as, as Australian drinkers, look familiar. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a country that we're going to continue to see more popularity with here in Australia because I think these wines make sense. And the grape varieties now, you've got a lot of winemakers, as you said before, now looking to plant these Portuguese varieties, as yes. they have with Spanish and yes. Italian um, in, in Australia. Uh, and, and they're thriving. They don't need the, you know, the amount of water to grow, and they love the exactly. heat. And, exactly. and stylistic, stylistically, still produce these lovely fragrant, medium body wine, red wine. I just, I just sent some, a mixed uh, uh, case of Portuguese whites and reds to the McLaren Vale last week to a winemaker. So, oh, great! They're 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 just keen to see um, what they do with those varietals, I guess. Yeah, and and what can be done. So exciting! Yeah. Oh, well, mate. Well, thank you for bringing these wines pleasure, in pleasure. and being a bit of a, a, a little bit of a pioneer there. It's really exciting. We love these wines. So, good on you, Matt, and uh, you. keep on with those quality estates. Excellent. Thanks, <laughs> Cheers, mate. Cheers, mate.